He's going to do a presentation titled A Technically Unified Earth. So let's welcome him. Hi, everyone. Uh, someone always has to overdress for these, these occasions. So I thought it would be me today. A Technically Unified Earth. Um, this is what I wanted to speak about today and, and what that means. The progression of our technical understandings uh, is observable when we look back at our evolution as a species. Yet, when looking at our current world, it does not surprise me to read about a general fear of technical advancement with problems such as job loss due to automation, uh, hacking of your private data, or the use of technology for warfare. Also, I see a general doubt in how people would ever come together to cooperate on such a large scale since we have to compete with each other now in order to survive. Yet when we speak of the economic model put forth uh, in the Zeitgeist Movement, we are talking about a global system based on the physical referent of natural systems rather than assumptions of human behavior. This new social structure does involve a global connectedness also expressed as unified. So let's take a look at how this typically is written about in our popular media. And I found a perfect, ar perfect article in my favorite newspaper, the Z-Day News. Technical advancement, progress or doom. A common theme I see in our mainstream media is that the editorials are framed within the context of technical advancement and a profit-driven culture. That's the assumed framework. And many of the articles and books I've seen make no distinction around technical innovation from a different framework outside of the monetary system when it comes to the application of technology. Our politics, our media, our online debates focus on short-term situations, mostly from a polarizing political or economic perspective, neglecting the larger social environmental context in which problems unfold. When those larger contexts are given due attention, it becomes clear that talking about a technically unified world is more than just focusing you know, on a gadget or a single piece of technology for sale in the marketplace. Our technical unification as a species cannot be understood unless one looks through an interdisciplinary lens, which becomes possible when one starts to adopt a systems worldview. To find out more about a systems worldview and understanding a systems approach, uh, you can find presentations I've done on this in the past that speak specifically on this subject. Uh, the first one I did was called Visualizing of Systems Approach, which I gave at uh, USC in 2011 at one of our town halls. Uh, and more recently, I did Thinking in Systems, which is part of our 2013 Z-Day main event that happened here in Los Angeles. And both are on YouTube uh, and give you a really good quick background on what we mean when we say systems uh, approach or systems uh, theory. Uh, but to continue on to tec technical unification, historically we can say that the average human beings that lived pre-20th century had each seen only about one million of the surface of the earth. And through a long progression of experiencing their environments and passing information through example or by audible form, all to the first written records, we can see something happening. The technical unification of humanity is an observed phenomenon, where we can see the serial nature of knowledge as it builds upon itself. There was a day when traversing the oceans was commonly deemed not possible, since we did not have the tools to reconcile beyond the immediate horizon. Or just as the notion of a computer and the idea of spaceflight may have seemed not possible to people living as recent as 200 years ago, the notion of a unified Earth may seem just as distant to us today, especially when we speak about the global nature of a natural law resource-based model. The reality is that this unification is a trend already taking place, and it has connected more of the world through the industrial revolutions of recent history, which happened out of the advent of scientific inquiry and the discovery of massive energy resources that were harnessable via the application of those scientifically derived understandings. As you can see from this incomplete montage, there is an accelerated trend in the human knowledge base. Our advocacy of technical unification is not meant as a point of faith in, in technical advancement or as a promise of future progress and success. The montage we just saw is to give some context to the serial nature of knowledge as it builds upon itself, while at the same time taking note of current problems like the inhibiting nature of economic inequality, debt slavery, and growing consumption just for the sake of profit. We acknowledge that these are systemic problems or system outcomes, which is why TZM advocates a different frame of reference to the culture. 
Now that said, our current philosophies continue to operate on the assumption of resource scarcity, a premise still embedded in the Malthusian undertones of our politics and media. The assumption that there is not enough to go around is presented to us from youth. And in the face of past scarcity and current economic inequality, I can see why it makes sense to promote Malthus's assumption about running out of resources. But this is an argument fixed at a certain point in time when production capacity was insufficient for the population and bases itself on a purely economic standpoint without factoring in scientific advancement or being able to do more with less. While looking for an image to show how we could address hunger and poverty, I came across a comment on a farming website that was in response to the not enough to go around premise of a main article. The comment said, to solve the hunger problem, we must look especially at our social organization and economic inequality issues and resolve them. I thought this was well stated and shows that there are people out there who are starting to change their world views. And it also came as a nice surprise considering the behavior I usually see on internet comment threads. And to conclude this point, taken right from the FAO, the UN's organization for food and agriculture, they state right in the middle of a very grim article on feeding the world that worldwide enough food is produced to feed everyone, yet this food and the technology to produce it do not always reach those in need. Now that's as much acknowledgement as you will find about our value system disorder from world organizations and is why a new economic framework, a new frame of reference is needed. Such a large transition may be possible if we understand some immediate transitions that are taking place right now. The technologies that are part of everyday life were scaled out during the first and second industrial revolutions. These errors involved a common energy base with supporting communication and transport mediums under various political and monetary ideals, depending on which nation you look at, with capitalism and fractional reserve banking becoming the principal method of organizing industry under quasi-democratic political systems. For Europe and the US in the 19th century, coal was the energy base driving the steam-powered engine. The printing press and the telegraph became the communication mediums for managing a coal-powered rail and factory infrastructure. In the 20th century, the telephone and later radio and television became the communication mediums for managing a geographically dispersed oil and auto transport infrastructure, along with suburban development and emerging mass consumer society. In the 21st century, the internet is becoming the communication medium for managing distributed renewable energies and automated logistics in what can be seen as an increasingly interconnected global commons. When we speak of a commons, we refer to things common to all. Public areas, knowledge, communication, the oceans, fresh air, water, and other essentials of life and social well-being. The idea behind a commons is that the earth and life upon it is not for sale. Today, virtually every commons has been enclosed, privatized, or commodified within the free market during the 200-year reign of capitalism. But the value systems and the ideologies that allow this behavior are now under scrutiny and review by people everywhere. A current revolution taking place in the area of a social commons is becoming known as the Internet of Things, or the IoT. This is what some consider the beginning of the third industrial revolution. Barring some language from author Jeremy Rifkin, which the book uh, Don referenced earlier, the Internet of Things will connect everything with everyone in an integrated global network, people, machines, natural resources, production, logistics, consumption habits, and virtually every other aspect of economic and social life will be linked via sensors and software to the IoT platform. In 2007, there were 10 million sensors connecting every type of human contrivance to the Internet of Things. In 2013, that number was about 3.5 billion sensors, and it's projected that by 2030, there will be 100 trillion sensors connected to the IoT platform, feeding back data into every connected node. In a world based on self-interest, competition, and profit, we live in an economic framework where our commons is for sale. And in this situation, it's easy to see how security, privacy, and protection from abuse is absolutely needed and a topic for further discussion within that context. But what I wish to explore today is the idea behind technical unification and what the IoT is. As a new phenomenon, 
based on laterally scaled collaborative structures where people interact, contribute, share, learn, and produce their own goods and services at a near zero marginal cost. The marginal cost uh, is the cost to produce every good after the fixed cost of the initial production is met. There is a fixed cost in writing and publishing the first copy of a book, but the duplication of that book in the IoT platform is nearly free. Therefore, the marginal cost of all subsequent production is noted to be near zero. The near zero marginal cost phenomena has already transformed the industry of information goods as millions of people produce and share their own music, videos, news, and knowledge for free in a collaborative commons via the internet. And today we can see zero marginal cost moving from the virtual world to the physical world. A great example of this is the changing landscape in Germany as is being done with the generation of electricity and a push to move away from coal and natural gas and implement renewable electric power nationwide within a decade's time. Right now about 90% of the solar power produced in Germany is done via a network of villages rather than pr the private sector and large corporations where people generate their own renewable power and feed that power back into the grid for distribution and use making that energy's cost essentially free. The IoT is also laying the groundwork for a digital manufacturing revolution of durable goods. An example of this is 3D printing. Within a collaborative commons, everyone can potentially be their own manufacturer. With sites such as MakerBot's Thingiverse, there are communities of individual designers and builders sharing over 100,000 3D designs of every kind of thing. Most of us are familiar with 2D printing using paper and text. But 3D printers create three-dimensional objects with computer-aided design. Software directs the 3D printer to build successive layers of a product using powder, molten plastic, or metals to create a solid object. A 3D printer can produce multiple copies, just like a photocopy machine. All sorts of goods, from jewelry to mobile phones, aircraft parts, medical implants, and batteries are being printed out through this method of additive manufacturing. This method is far less waste, wasteful from traditional subtractive manufacturing, which is what we mainly do today, where the majority of a resource is used to produce uh, any good goes to waste. And to show how this is evolving, here is an example of the first 3D printed car made from a carbon fiber reinforced plastic. The prototype is already drivable at speeds of 40 miles per hour and distances of 120 miles on a single charge. This physical object could be modified and emailed to you then printed using only what was needed, and if powered from a renewable energy source using local materials, it will eventually reach a near zero marginal cost to produce, eventually. And shown here is what's called a scaffold for a human ear being printed. This material allows human cells to attach to it from the recipient, uh, growing their natural tissue back in its place as the bioink dissolves away during the healing process. And also shown is a kidney being printed through a similar process. Physical and organic objects being created through digitized means. This evolution is happening right now and will change the social landscape in a similar way the sharing of information goods has already done. It's a short-sighted view to think the solutions we need will come from tapping the intelligence of payrolled employees. And the limitations of traditional monetary economics are showing their adverse effects through environmental damage, through crime rates, and unemployment and debt levels. Sustainability is not part of the current system's design. What we're looking at now is a transition to a laterally scaled global network of people collaborating in a global commons. Mass collaboration is something that is particularly possible today because of the internet. It is technology that really enables the creation and application of these ideas at scales we pre previously could not reach. There are also many good examples of mass collaboration today. Sharing of designs, uh, 3D printing, open source projects, massive open online courses, and more. It opens up some possibilities for creating a technically unified operating platform that accounts for the planet, our environment, and our human need and well-being. And a perspective I wish to pass on to you today is to consider how we are already unified as a world population. This is not a complete list, but just some things to consider. Communications, economics, mobility, and life ground needs. We are already unified in these areas. Being able to travel and communicate around the globe, this video will be accessible to anybody with a handheld device and an internet connection. But I wish to place emphasis on one of these areas in particular. 
we couldn't ask for a better example of being unified than a natural world. We already exist inside a unified Earth system, namely the biosphere, the approximate 40 miles from the outer atmosphere down to the ocean depth. This is our spaceship Earth, which contains the synergistic natural systems which bond us all together. Within this layer is all life capacity. If we are able to understand the systems that make up our spaceship Earth as the interplay of interrelated technical processes, then the transition of humanity to a technical unity can be seen as mirroring this already existing structure. With all this technical potential, there is still a road to be traveled. We share more similarities than differences in the natural world. There are strong ideological differences in our political ideals, religious beliefs, and personal views. The psychological barriers we have yet to bridge may not be easy, but that in no way changes where we need to go, which makes TZM and our activism all the more necessary for updating the social landscape and laying the value system groundwork for such a unified world. This concludes my talk today. I appreciate your listening, and uh, thank you for your time. And there'll be a Q&A later if you have questions. Thanks.